It's been a long time coming, but I know my, my change gonna come. Oh, yes, it will. Encourage us to not get weary in this ongoing struggle for righteousness, for freedom, um, for truth. And in your name, we ask that as we leave this space, that we will commit ourselves like never before to be, as Martin Luther King said, drum majors for justice, to be agents of rebirth and renewal and refocus in our cities and our nations and in the world. This we ask in your sovereign name. Amen and Ashe. Chitty. Okay. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, it's really wonderful to be here this morning. Um, I'm going to share a few thoughts and reflections um, on race and empire and power and whiteness. So I want to start with a story. So a few years ago, before I worked for Christian Aid, I had the privilege of going to Israel, Palestine with Christian Aid on a media trip. Um, and we arrived at a village called Beit Fajar, just outside East Jerusalem. We were surrounded by young children who surrounded us and wanted us to um, be friends with them on Facebook. To They wanted to talk about SpongeBob SquarePants. And um, I remember with that we took a, a photo. And, and there was a photo of me surrounded by all these children. And when I returned from that trip, I looked at my photo with the children in Beit Fajar and there was something slightly jarring about it. Because I look out of place as if there is, the, as if there's been a miscasting. Because my role in that photo, I feel, should be played by a white person. Because we're not used to seeing black people being the heroes. Often it's white men who are. In his 1899 poem, much loved British poet Rudyard Kipling described the moral obligation that the white race was under to civilize other people groups through settler colonialism. It said, take up the white man's burden, send forth the best ye breed, go bind your sons to exile to serve your captives need to wait in heavy harness on flutters folk and wild, your new court sullen peoples, half devil and half child. Now, although the poem was in fact written about the American colonization of the Philippine Islands, it indirectly supports this idea of the British Empire. Commenting on the poem, one historian wrote, the implication of course, was that the empire existed not for the benefit economic or strategic or otherwise of Britain itself, but in order that primitive peoples incapable of self-government could with British guidance eventually become civilized and Christianized. Now the world of international development in which I work often perpetuates the idea of the white savior. It's what far too often underlies our fundraising techniques and seeps into our language. In my organization, Christian Aid, we're trying hard to decolonize development and to question whether or not we represent the communities in which we work with dignity. What does it mean to help the world's poorest communities if in doing so, we are not the heroes? So we've moved away from describing the people we work with in the global south as beneficiaries, because it implies a passivity that's undignified. Now, as someone of Nigerian descent who also works in development for a faith-based organization, I have a dual perspective on issues of empire and race and development, and all of this intertwined with Christianity. So to my own personal story, so I was yet to be a twinkle in anyone's eye when the white man came to the village of my ancestors selling salvation. Spurred by the Great Commission of Matthew's Gospel, these Europeans made it their mission to go into all the world and preach the good news to people who look like me. So actually, my journey to faith began long before I was born. In the southeast of Nigeria, 
where my great grandparents had left the native religion of the Igbo ethnic group and followed the religion of the white man, the Christian faith. So when thinking about my Christian heritage, I often think of the great Chino Achebe's novel, um, Things Fall Apart, in which it says this, it says, the white man is very clever. He came quietly and peaceably with his religion. We were amused at his foolishness and allowed him to stay. Now he has won our brothers and our clan can no longer act like one. He has put a knife on the things that held us together and we have fallen apart. My great grandfather, Canon Emmanuel Ene, or Papanuku, as we call him, was an ordained minister in the Church of England and presided over churches in Igbo land in the rural areas of the southeastern region of Nigeria. Now, brides to be would often come to stay with my great grandmother, uh, Mamanuku, uh, before getting married to learn how to be good Christian wives. Now, in essence, this meant teaching. Nigerian women how to bake cakes and serve tea in china cups. Um, now this image is a jarring juxtap juxtaposition when I think about the vibrancy and the colour and the flavours of our native food and ways of being. The thought that we would have swapped bold traditional fabrics for white lace or eye-wateringly spicy pepper soup for cucumber sandwiches because somewhere along the way, Christianity had accidentally been bound up with Englishness, is heartbreaking and it's infuriating. And so from before my faith journey began, it's been difficult for me to extricate Christianity from the notion of Englishness and whiteness and colonialism. And that's still the case in Nigeria today. So gone are the attempts to retell the Christian story through our own words and rhythms and cultures. Instead, contextual retelling is replaced with the shiny facade of American evangelicalism. 20th century globalization continued the work of colonial Christianity, even though globally, the statistical portrait of a Christian is more likely to look like me than most of the people you will find on a European Christian TV channel. And when we moved to the UK, we found that some people thought that Christianity was just for white people or that black Christianity was to be found somewhere else. And what I have experienced in my three and a half decades of majority white church at local and national level in the UK is that somewhere along the way, this truth has been contorted into all sorts of messages that keep some people with all the power and others without. Christianity to many of us in the UK is synonymous with whiteness and privilege. Our churches are full of people with degrees, but sometimes it takes us paying attention, really paying attention to recognize it, paying attention to the stories that we are telling each other about who is worthy, about whose voices should be heard, about who should have a seat at the table. Now, white supremacy, of course, is not just a British thing. Um, it's because of our colonialist histories that many countries in the global south have also been conditioned to believe that white is right. That's why skin bleaching products are sold in such high quantities in some countries in Africa, for example. I want to tell you a story about um, uh, a couple of years ago, um, me and my family went to Nigeria for my grandmother's funeral. And the whole family gathered together from all over the world for a three days funeral with a thousand people at the main event. My family decided that we would combine the celebrations with the dedication of our then two-year-old, my son. Um, we wanted something hopeful on which to end the occasion. And so it was that my husband and I found ourselves dancing up the aisle with around 50 relatives, plus goats, yams, and wads full of cash. And our son was um, accidentally baptized at the end of the aisle, but um, that's another story. Um, the Methodist minister said that he had felt particularly blessed that day because our son was the first child the new ministers had dedicated in this church. And they were even more blessed because the child was an Oyibo, just a white person, um, and that a white man, my husband, Mark, was there. 
and everyone whooped and cheered. Now, Mark's experience of being an ethnic minority is very, very different from mine. But what this showed me was that even in those spaces, in the heart of uh, a rural church in Southeast Nigeria, that he was seen, seen as being the one with the power. Now, there's a part of me that maybe might be able to understand the white supremacy that exists within mainstream Western society and even on the geopolitical scale. But my frustration is the fact that the church so often replicates it and adopts whiteness as power without question or without giving it a second thought. I believe the church is supposed to communicate race better than this. Not because we are better people, but because at the crux of the Christian faith is this crazy idea that like we read in in Ephesians, there is no more dividing wall of hostility. Just like the barrier broken between God and humanity, the church should actively be the one that breaks down the dividing walls that exist between people groups. Because in the upside down nature of the kingdom of God, the power should be in unexpected hands. But so often it's not. And recent years have made me question whether the story of white supremacy being sold in our churches is really what I signed up to. This present political moment, the aftermath of Trump, Brexit, and the rise of far-right nationalism has been shocking to so many of us. But it's also exacerbated the divides that exist. Speaking to the New York Times about the numbers of people of color leaving white evangelical churches in the US in the wake of Trump's election, Michael Emerson, who wrote a book called Divided by Faith said, the election itself was the single most harmful event to the whole movement of reconciliation in at least the past 30 years. It's about to completely break apart. Now he wrote that of course, um, before Capitol Hill, before um, George Floyd, so we can see how the past year has exacerbated the fractures that exist within our communities in the US, but also in the UK. In these really fragile days politically, sometimes the Christianity I see in the public sphere has appeared so contrary to the truth that I have at times doubted whether I can still be a part of it. When Christianity becomes too closely aligned with power and privilege and protection and empire, rather than justice and freedom for the marginalized and oppressed. In thinking about my experience as a black person within white majority church spaces, my thoughts have often been punctuated by, by doubt. A doubt about whether I really have anything to say on the issue. I've never faced what some might describe as explicit overt racism. I've never been called the N-word or heard it preached anywhere that black people are inferior but I have definitely been made to feel like I don't belong. I moved from Nigeria with my parents and younger sisters to the UK when I was four years old. So for much of my childhood, I had a Nigerian passport and not a British one. And that made going on school trips abroad awful. I remember arriving on the coach heading to Calais in France. Um, the border police would get on the bus and I'd be hoiked off the bus for my interview it was humiliating and isolating and it made me feel extremely other and very unwelcome. Now I remember the first trip I went on once I had my British passport. It was amazing. I loved the freedom that came with it. And it reminded me of the Ephesians 2 passage which, which said, consequently you are no longer foreigners and strangers but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. But despite having a British passport, I was still black. And when you're a black family of five turning up at all white churches in places like Hertfordshire or Kent or Hampshire, people notice. I recall my parents being asked once by a woman on the welcome team why they had chosen that particular church to attend instead of the black church down the road. Now, I'm sure she thought her question was harmless, but I have never, ever forgotten it. 
it suggested that not only did she see our race first rather than see us as members of God's big family, her family, but that the norm she had become accustomed to was that white people were here and that black people were over there. In my career working with, within Christian charities, I've been surprised at the number of times people have asked me things like, Chinny, what do black majority churches think about X? Uh, the assumption being that since I am black, I go to a black church. We've often heard it said that church remains one of the most racially segregated spaces in society. I was asked uh, a year or two ago uh, in an interview for an American evangelical as an evangelical magazine about black majority churches in the UK. And I made a remark about my belief that ultimately we should all be working towards churches that are multiracial. Now the interviewer disagreed, saying it would surely be unfair for people of other cultures to have to lose their identity and conform. Now his words betrayed his belief that clearly the majority race is normative and that all other races, their cultures and traditions and distinct ways of being would naturally be subsumed by whiteness. And this is white supremacy in action. White supremacy doesn't just come in the Klansman's white cape, but in the subtle words that seem to betray the idea that white is right. White supremacy can come not in literal chains and shackles, but the narrow definition of who and what is beautiful. White supremacy can come in the form of monochrome leadership, theology, and practice. My experience as a black person in white majority spaces, in the empire of white majority spaces, is that white is right and everything else is color. But I do believe that the beauty of the Christian story is in Christ drawing together all people from all places and breaking down the dividing wall of hostility. At times when I thought about race issues within the church, I've been met with a retort that says that all are equal under God and therefore we shouldn't play into identity politics. In other words, I've been warned not to play the race card. Um, the majority white church asks us not to play that card while simult simultaneously doing a very good job at highlighting our difference in ways that make us uncomfortable. So I think back to the International Sundays um, I used to attend when I was younger at church, where we were encouraged to bring our native food, dress in our traditional outfits and celebrate our culture. And these days would provide a certain level of anxiety for me as a young person, because I was already confused enough about my own identity. Was I British or was I Nigerian? Should my parents bring jollof rice to share or coronation chicken, quiche and cucumber sandwiches? Um, I realise that what I'm saying is contradictory and can be confusing um, for white, well-meaning white people. I've said my culture should be celebrated, but that you shouldn't point out that I'm different. And I want you to recognise where I'm, where I'm from, um, but I've spent far too many hours tying myself in knots trying to appear wholly British without any hint of the Nigerian heritage that I used to be ashamed of. But I tell you this because I want to give you an insight into the constant battle that goes on inside my mind. Questions, confusion, and internal angst about home and belonging and identity. As theologian Ekemeni Uwan wrote, this is the psyche of the colonized mind, always at war with itself. One of the main ways in which our faith has been aligned with whiteness as power is, of course, through the representations of God and Jesus themselves. Now, the first time I encountered God in my likeness was in a shack. Like millions of others, I had been reading The Shack, um, the New York Times bestselling novel by Canadian author William P. Young. It tells the story of a man who, torn apart by grief after an unspeakable tragedy, encounters God in three persons in a shack in the middle of nowhere. Now, spoiler alert, if you plan to read the book anytime soon, but don't want to know the punchline, you might want to maybe turn off now. But in the, in the book, God is represented by the Holy Spirit in the form of an Asian woman, Jesus in the form of a Middle Eastern man, and Papa, God the Father, in the form of a curvy black woman. 
Now, those who had read the book were careful not to give spoilers. So when, when I encountered Papa in the pages of the book, I was left open mouthed. Never had I imagined that God could be portrayed in this way. I remember calling my mum, who had read the book before me. We were excited, overwhelmed, yet also rendered speechless. Because in this depiction, God looked just like us. It had never occurred to me before that, that Jesus wasn't white. By the time I woke up to this fact, it was far too late to reconfigure the image that I had of God in my mind. Now, to this day, when I picture Jesus, I think of a piercing, blue-eyed man with a brown beard and sandy neck-length hair. He looks like Robert Powell did in the 1977 Jesus of Nazareth film. He doesn't look ordinary, but he does look white. And at times when I've pictured Christ on a cross and cried out to him in my darkest moments, prayed to him for those things I have desired most, some praise to him in worship. I have pictured a man who never existed. The Jesus I have clung to is a falsehood, a symbol created by the effect, the effect of white supremacist fiction. God isn't a white man. And this revelation is painful and brings with it a realization that white supremacy has found its way into the most sacred place. Now, although painful, however, the realization that Jesus was not white has brought with it a profound sense of liberation. God is not white. And for some, this fact seems just as difficult to grab, grapple with as the idea that God is not a man. Most who have read the Bible or know any part of its history, whether they believe in Jesus or not, know that the incarnate God in human form would have looked like a man from what we've come to call the Middle East, born in Bethlehem. Now, as I said, I've been fortunate enough to visit that place uh, and meet its people, each a different shade of brown. But the Jesus that I picture looks nothing like them. He looks like an American hippie from the 1970s. The archetypal depiction of Jesus we see today is thought to have originated in the fourth century during the Byzantine era, when the image of an enthroned emperor with long hair and beard came to be the predominant way of representing Jesus. Now, much later on, this evolved into the more hippie-like representation of Jesus we see today. But white Jesus is the consequence of a number of Western historical, theological, and sociological prejudices that were so fundamental to the notion of white superiority that Christ could not have been anything but. One of the main factors, argues theologian Sean Kelly, um, who wrote a book called Racializing Jesus, was that 18th century German theologians argued among themselves about the ideas that on one hand, Jesus Christ was ordinary, and on the other hand, he was completely otherworldly. Now, I remember my first introduction to the historic Jesus during lectures on Christology at Cambridge University. As an 18 year old who had grown up in conservative evangelicalism, I found shocking the idea that Jesus was, was in many ways ordinary. And placed within the historical context of first century Palestine, Jesus could be seen as an essentially Jewish figure whose teachings were in line with those of other Jewish sages at the time. Those who wanted to downplay the ordinariness of Jesus and elevate his unique divinity subsequently became more anti-Judaism in their depictions of Jesus. So some theologians sought then to offer various solutions that stood Jesus apart from his Palestinianness and his Jewishness. So this is what led to this idea that instead, Jesus was in fact racially Aryan, set apart from his Jewishness and his so-called ordinariness. So white Jesus became a way of emphasizing Christ's divinity as distinct from the brownness of his historical context. Now the alignment of Christianity with power and whiteness over the centuries is the greatest PR spin the world has ever seen. Now we must resist it and we must refuse to fall for it. 
Christianity, the way of Christ, is not a religion of those with power, but a sanctuary for the powerless. God is found not in those wielding their authority over others, but in those who wa wash the cracked and bruised feet of the tired and the oppressed. We know that God, who being in very nature God, Christ, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. I know that there's a lot in there and there might be um, some questions um, to come, but I want us just to pray um, this prayer for racial justice by Dr. Martin Luther King. It's a prayer that's called Shake Us From Our Slumber. So let me pray this to end. When our eyes do not see the gravity of racial injustice, shake us from our slumber and open our eyes, O Lord. When out of fear we are frozen into inaction, give us a spirit of bravery, O Lord. When we try our best but say the wrong things, give us a spirit of humility, O Lord. When the chaos of this dies down, give us a lasting spirit of solidarity, O Lord. When it becomes easier to point fingers outward, help us to examine our own hearts, O Lord. God of truth, in your wisdom, enlighten us. God of love, in your mercy, forgive us. God of hope, in your kindness, heal us. Creator of all people, in your generosity, guide us. Racism breaks your heart. Break our hearts for what break yours, breaks yours, O Lord. Ever-present God, you called us to be in relationship with one another and promise to dwell wherever two or three are gathered. In our community, we are many different people. We come from many different places, have many different cultures. Open our hearts that we may be bold in finding the riches of inclusion and the treasures of diversity among us. We pray in faith. Amen. Chinny, thank you so much for that. Thank you for giving so much of yourself in it. We're going to, to go into breakout rooms.